Hey guys, Aris, Hardware Busters. Intel released its new CPUs, 11th generation, with code name Rocket Lake, which uses the same LGA 1200 socket as the previous generation, Comet Lake. The flagship model is the i9-11900K and the second best is the i7-11700K. I will deal with the latter in this review and compare it to the AMD Ryzen 7 5800X, which costs about the same. Briefly about the Rocket Lake CPU line, we still have 14 nanometers lithography, although Intel has 10 nanometers already used in Ice Lake CPUs. Since the new Cypress Cove cores are larger than the Skylake cores of the Comet Lake CPUs, and the same goes for the Generation 12 iGPU, there's no space on the PCB for 10 cores on the i9 model, which is now restricted to only 8 cores. And without any further ado, these are the changes in the new Rocket Lake CPUs. New Cypress Cove cores. New iGPU promising much better performance with code name UHD Graphics 750. The iGPU also offers hardware acceleration of 10-bit AV1 and 12-bit HCVC video formats. Updated input-output platform with PCI Express 4 support. More PCI lanes in the Z590 chipset make faster the connection between the CPU and the attached NVMe interface. DL Boost technology for faster AI applications, new AVX512 instruction sets, official support for DDR4 3200MHz RAM, and Gear 1 and Gear 2 memory controller modes. A quick look at the i7-11700K. It costs $412, it has 8 cores, 16 threads, and its base clock is 3.6 GHz. The maximum boost clock for a single core is 5 GHz, and all cores can go up to 4.6 GHz at the same time. Compared to the 10700K CPU, it has lower clocks, but thanks to the higher IPC instructions per cycle and various improvements on the boost frequency mechanisms, it achieves better performance. Intel Z590 chipset. This is a new chipset and not just an upgrade of the previous generation. It is manufactured using 14 nanometers lithography and it supports DMI3 with 8 lanes, double the bandwidth of the last chipset as long as a Rocket Lake CPU is used. Some more changes compared to the Z490R. Natural support of USB 3.2x2, 20 GBPs. Now, if you use a compatible USB audio DAC, audio processing is handled by the chipset and not the CPU. And Intel, MIPI Soundwire sound interface. Gear 1 and Gear 2 memory controller modes. The memory controller on the Rocket Lake CPUs now supports two modes, Gear 1 with 1 to 1 frequency with lower clocked RAM and 1 to 2 frequency for higher speed RAM modules in Gear 2. In Gear 1 you will most likely stop at uh, 3200 MHz RAM while Gear 2 can support much faster modules. Test system. I use an Asus TUF Z590 mainboard and I also had to buy the CPU since Intel is not cooperating with us, unfortunately. Against the Intel system, I have an Asus TUF Gaming X570 Plus mainboard equipped with an AMD Ryzen 50 800X CPU, which a local store M Systems provided. Thank you very much, M Systems, for this. The rest components are the same as the Intel system to have comparable results. The platform is not mature enough, so I had lots of trouble with some XPG memory 
equipped with SK Hynix chips clocked at 4133 MHz. I couldn't make it run even with the XMP profiles and with lower speeds at 4000 MHz and gear 2 of course. I managed to run the memory only uh, with 3600 MHz but still the system wasn't entirely stable. In the end, I changed the RAM modules with a Patriot Viper 16GB kit featuring Samsung BDI chips and all my problems were solved. Another issue is that you won't get much out of the CPU at default settings because VCode gets too high and the 125W load limit is easily broken. So after a few seconds, the boost clock speeds drop notably. Even if you have top-notch cooler installed as I did. That said, with the CPU core voltage at auto, I even noticed up to 280 watts power consumption by the CPU at boost clocks, which is too high of course for any cooler to handle. To set things straight and check how the Intel CPU performs at stock and boost clocks, and given the good air cooler that I used, I decided to change some BIOS settings. I suggest you also make the same changes if you have good cooling as well. I manually set the CPU's core voltage at 1.35 volts from the BIOS. I should note here that voltage settings didn't work out as expected in some cases, providing much higher or notably lower voltage levels to the CPU, so you should be careful here. I guess this was a BIOS bug. If you have higher than 3200 MHz RAM modules, you should select gear 2 or 1 to 2 ratio equivalent to ASUS mainboards. Set the long duration package power limit high enough depending on your cooling system's capabilities. In my case, I went up to 225 watts. I also increased the power limit on my AMD Ryzen 7 CPU to have a fair comparison. I left the thermal limit at the default settings 90 degrees Celsius, which is high enough. And test results. We start with synthetic benchmarks. More specifically, I start with SuperPI, which uses only single thread to calculate 32 million digits of pi. The W prime is used to find the first 1024 million prime numbers. AIDA64 CPU benchmarks, digital photo processing, encryption, and hashing. Rendering benchmarks. In Blender, I use the BMW 27 scene. Cinebench has both single and multi third benchmarks. The Corona renderer might be old but still provides some valuable insights about the CPU's rendering capabilities. DaVinci Resolve is one of the best video editing apps, even at its free version. I use it to extract a 4K video without utilizing the GPU's capabilities. And for last, Keyshot, where I rendered the bathroom scene, which takes quite some time. Software development. I compile a large project in Microsoft's Visual Studio to evaluate all CPUs. Web browser performance. The Google Octane 2 tests saw the performance of the JavaScript engine. The Mozilla Kraken is similar to the Octane, measuring the execution time of the JavaScript code. AI Machine Learning. To fully utilize a machine's capabilities and solve complex problems, you first have to train it. The more data you feed it during training, the better becomes its neural network, which is the one that will provide the final results. TensorFlow is based on Python and has been developed by Google. It supports both CPUs and GPUs, but in my case, I will only use its CPU support. Productivity in Microsoft Office. I use the PC Mac 10 benchmark suite to evaluate all CPUs under several productivity tasks. I also use the Applications benchmark, which uses all Microsoft Office apps. Data Compress. I use two popular Compress apps, WinRAR and 7-Zip. Both have embedded 
benchmarks and I also compress a large file folder with WinRAR. Media encoding. I convert a 4K video to HD format with 30 frames per second using Handbrake. HD game tests. Using a powerful GPU at low resolutions, I make sure that there is no bottleneck in this section so I can easily check the CPU performance differences. Power consumption. I use the Powernetics system to measure power consumption on both EPS connectors of the CPU and at the same time I also measure the delivered power through the 12V rail on the 24-pin ATX connector. Given that the GPU in my power consumption test operates at 2G mode, the power that it draws from the PEG slot is low. Energy usage. Besides power consumption, I also take a look at the energy usage of each CPU to see how efficient they are. By calculating the total amount of power required to finish two tasks, a super PI run indicative for single-threaded applications, and a Cinebench run for multi-threaded scenarios. Operating temperatures. I use an Noctua NHD15S air cooler which doesn't have a problem handling high loads up to 225 watts. To check on the operating temperatures, I run Blender instead of Prime 95 and small FFTs which apply an unrealistically high load to the CPU. I should note that I consider the temperature reported by the CPU's corresponding sensor, so there will be differences here, since Intel and AMD don't have this sensor installed in the same place. Although the AMD CPU reports a notably higher temperatures at 91.3 degrees Celsius, still the Noctua cooler wasn't as hot, so I'm sure that AMD's readings are too high. Overclocking. It doesn't have any meaning at all to try the, to overclock the i7-11700K unless you have extreme cooling. Under normal conditions, you will lose lots of performance in single-thread applications since you will deactivate it Turbo Boost Max Technology 3, which individually clocks higher the CPU's good cores. I tried a lot to achieve 4.8 GHz on all cores, but I couldn't make the system stable whatever I tried. After 20 minutes of key shot rendering, I had a crash. The best thing now you can do to achieve better performance is to increase the power limit, but you should have strong cooling to do that. Overall performance. As you can see in all CPU tests that I conducted, the difference between these two processors is 1.8%. Still the AMD wins here. Gaming performance. This is a win for the Intel CPU. Performance per euro, since I used prices in euros. The AMD CPU is ahead, as you can see here. Epilog. The new Intel platform needs work to get more stable and fix all these annoying issues, especially with RAM compatibility. It is not easy to set up, contrary to the AMD Ryzen platform, which is mature and trouble-free. How things turn. Hmm. An Intel platform that isn't stable while the AMD platform doesn't have any problems at all. Another significant issue is the CPU selectability with memory modules and more specifically the XPG Spectrix G50 which uses SK Hynix chips. There was no way to make this RAM operate at its nominal frequency even with the XMP profiles activated, so I changed it with the Patriot Viper kit with Samsung B dies and all of my problems were solved. I've also tried the Crucial Ballistics Elite kit at 4000 MHz and there weren't any issues at all. The boot time when you make a significant change in BIOS settings is long and in some cases some double boots gave me to the nerves. On the other hand, whatever change I tried, even the most stupid ones, they didn't make the mainboard stuck at boot and require a clear CMOS to proceed, which was the case for my AMD mainboard. In gaming, the i7-11700K performs well, but it loses in the general CPU performance by the Ryzen 7 5800X CPU, which 
needs less watts, less power in multi-threaded applications. With the power limit properly set and a good cooling solution, the Intel CPU won't let you down, but it required some bias settings to deliver its best performance. And it was a bummer that it didn't operate correctly with all of my memory kits. Although I believe that through a BIOS update, this can be solved. Despite the good gaming performance and the not so large differences in overall performance, given that it has the same price as the AMD 5800X, I will go with the latter. Hopefully, the following Intel CPUs will be more competitive and fire up against the CPU race where AMD currently dominates. Pros! Good performance in low thread applications, very good gaming performance, quite good performance with a high power limit, unlocked multiplier, PCI Express 4 support, compatible with the Z490 mainboards, AVX512 and DL Boost support, and an updated iGPU which I didn't have any time to test. Cons. It requires some manual settings and good cooling to get the most out of it, high energy consumption in multi-thread applications, it cannot meet the Ryzen 7 5800X in general CPU tasks, quite selective when it comes to RAM, and in gear 1 mode you will have problems with RAM speeds over 3200 MHz. And finally, only one PCI Express 4 M.2 slot. This was another review by Hardware Busters International. Stay tuned for more, subscribe to our channels and see you in one of our next videos. Bye bye!